Medical Dialogues presents Health Dialogues show. I am Dr. Nandita Mohan and today I will be discussing a very important topic with all of you that is cervical cancer. Now to give us an in-depth knowledge about cervical cancer, its causes, its symptoms, treatment as well as the diagnosis perspective, we have with us today who has joined us Dr. Divya Singh who is a senior general surgeon at Ram Manohar Lohia Hospital in Delhi. Her interests lie in breast endocrine surgery as well as surgical oncology specialities she has a meritorious healthcare professional she is a meritorious healthcare professional with extensive experience as a surgeon in various reputed medical facilities across india and the united states she has many distinctions awards published papers fel- felicitations and licenses added on to her name dr divya is a member of several illustrious medical associations including the indian medical association south ward the society of american gastrointestinal and endoscopic surgery surgeons the indian association of gastrointestinal and endoscopic surgeons and the association of women surgeons among others welcome to medical dialogues ma'am we are really happy to have you on board here with us thank you for joining us at medical dialogues today thank you thank you so much for having me and i'm so happy to be talking about this topic it's so important for all women across the world not just in india Great, uh, great. So now that we're talking about cervical cancer, if you could just briefly explain to us what is cervical cancer and how common is it? Yes. So um, as we all know, cervix is that part of the uterus which is the lowermost part, and it just joins the uterus to the birth canal or the vagina. So all the cancers with which emanate from this part would be under the category of cervical cancer. So within the cervix also there are two parts the ecto cervix which is the part which is um facing towards the vagina or the birth canal and we have the endo cervix which is towards the uterus and usually um you know the lining is such that the lower part the ecto cervix has squamous type of cells the endo cervix has more adeno type of cells that is like glands which secrete mucus and there is a junction between the two and this is the junction where most of the cancers come um uh, from um most of these cancers we'll talk about like what causes them but they're caused because of a virus called the hpv virus and uh, they usually start as pre malignant lesions so that is exactly what we're trying to catch when we do all these pap smears and hpv tests etc and sometimes unfortunately though you know these cancers present at a very advanced stage where you know they're in the form of a tumor and it has spread to you know uh, places which are around the uterus the lymph nodes and maybe even the surrounding structures within the pelvis so that in a nutshell would be you know everything uh, that in a layman's term what cervical cancer would great great uh, so now that you've talking about it in detail uh, what according to you will be the risk factors which actually raise the risk for cervical cancer yeah so the risk factors mainly include uh, you know early onset of your sexual debut so in girls we usually tell them that it should be after 18 after 21 but there are many countries across the world and even in india we have uh, in some states we have like uh, the statistics in mizoram and in places like dibrugarh all these places you'd see the marriages happen really early so an early sexual debut having multiple sexual partners um being exposed to multiple sexual partners because there are some women who are in uh, are sex workers uh then it can also it has also been associated with you know the taking of oc pills but that has really not been understood why and also some women who have multiple births and um uh because you know they say that during pregnancy your immuno uh, immunity uh, you become immuno compromised your immunity goes down so that can be one of the causes and in general all those women who are immuno compromised either because of you know they've been living with hi or uh, they have autoimmune disease they've had an organ transplant so they can, they're taking drugs to like sort of you know tamper down the immunity all these situations will lead to um, you know uh, a predisposition towards cervical cancer and then we have the other category where you know there's been a family history of cancers uh, cervical cancer breast cancer ovarian cancer or uh, it was back in the 70s they used to use something which is known as des or diethyl still bestrol and that was used to prevent miscarriages but like a lot of women who were born uh, or who were you know uh, in the reproductive age group around that time and have used that drug they are more predisposed to cervical cancer than um, the women today because we don't use that drug much today and generally you know having a diet which is not very rich in fruits and vegetables can predispose you and there's also a factor which prevents cervical cancer that is those women who use iud's or intrauterine contraceptive devices uh they're supposed there's supposed to be some connection against not being studied well but um it protects you from cervical cancer 
so in a nutshell these would be the reasons why uh, you know a woman would be more predisposed uh, as compared to a woman who's had a monogamous relationship who's not had so many uh, sexual partners etc great that was a very crisp explanation about uh, what the risk factors will be so uh, now that you've mentioned you've elaborated on the risk factors uh, what are the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer and what can be the possible causes for its uh, occurrence the risk factors you've already mentioned as as you've already talked about yes yes so uh, the occurrence like i said one of the biggest reasons i would say in india it would be around 80 to 85% of the cases would be because of the human papilloma virus or the hpv virus so the virus actually is like 200 different viruses but you can divide them into low risk types low risk means that it will you may get infected and you know there was recently a report that i was reading just literally like two days back which said one in three men have hpv so a lot of women are going to be exposed to hpv anyway but you know these strains are such that our immunity is able to wash it off in a year or two and that's mm-hmm. why i said you know it's diff- it's a bit dangerous in immuno compromised women as compared to those you know with good working immunities So the other type are the high risk types. Now these are like type 16, 18 and there are many others around uh, you know 14, 15 different types. Mm-hmm. These are the ones which really cause the cancer. So they'll you know uh, cause metaplastic and dysplastic changes which are basically changes that change um, you know the way a cancer like a, a cell is differentiated but they will make it into an undifferentiated cell which causes the cancer and the spread of that cancer. Um so yeah this is basically the thing and how does it present you know like it's a, it's very common the symptoms and like you know one of the things i would like to you know tell the audience is that if there are any such symptoms you must rush to your gynecologist your obstetrician uh because it's it's really simple so if a woman is bleeding during intercourse if a woman is bleed having severe pain during intercourse if she's having any sort of bloody discharge with a very strong odor uh from time to time from the vagina if she is having uh her periods regularly but in between the periods mm-hmm. there is heavy bleeding with a with a strong odor or uh, the bleeding goes on for a longer period of time these would be the signs and symptoms where she should immediately rush because even if it's nothing it warrants some sort of checkup so uh, these would be the most common symptoms and if uh, there is a case of advanced cancer unfortunately uh, you know it involves the urinary bladder the urethra she will have difficulty in urinating if it involves the rectum she would have lots of pain in the abdomen difficulty while passing stools uh, there can be a lot of dull back pain uh, swelling of the thighs and the legs uh there can also be general cachexia and fatigue and losing lot of weight which is associated with all sorts of cancers so yeah these would be uh, you know uh, the kind of symptoms that you would see both in like the not very initial stages but also the advanced type of cervical cancers great that was a very good information about uh, the different types of signs and symptoms that one can present so now that you've talked about the signs and symptoms how can it be diagnosed what are the diagnostic tools that one can actually take even at home or uh, once they visit the doctor and what tests can one undertake for screening of uh, cervical cancer right so um so there are two tests which you should like all women should start once they hit 21 so uh, the first would be the hpv screen and the second is the pap smear which the with the full form of which is the papanicolaou test so basically in the hpv test we're checking whether it is if you are infected with a high risk sort of um, you know strain of the virus and the pap smear is nothing but checking the cervical cell so we insert a speculum into your vagina and just take a small swab in a brush of the cervical cells they come off because they're being shed on a daily basis generally so there's no like you no pain nothing absolutely nothing that you feel and that we see under a microscope and we look at it just like i said a short while ago for dysplastic changes have the cells changed is there any difference in the cytoplasm in the nuclei and that way we can tell you if it's a cancer or not so these are the two major tests but supposing one of these tests come positive what do you do then then we would go ahead with something which is known as a colposcopy that again would involve like putting a speculum and under like a uh, it's a sort of a magnifying glass you would like we would like to see what sort of lesions are there on the cervix and if there is a lesion can we take maybe a biopsy of it biopsies are also of different kinds it's just a punch biopsy you can curate it out using a small spoon like instrument or uh, there are cryobiopsies that can be done there's even an electrical wire biopsy 
and all these are painless because they're done under local anesthesia sometimes mm-hmm. if it's a very big tumor or lesion we do a conical biopsy that's done under general anesthesia so again no pain uh, to the women and um, uh, with this again it goes for pathological testing and uh, the pathologist will be able to tell us like whether it is cancerous and uh, what is the stage uh, how how much invasion has happened and then once we've diagnosed whether it is a cancer then you have to go ahead with the same set of things that we do for other cancers like doing a chest x-ray checking for any mets using a ct scan pet scan or an mri scan and doing your blood tests and then we plan for the treatment uh, surely so now that you've briefly explained about this and now we're coming back coming to the uh, treatment management aspect of it you just mentioned if you can just briefly explain how it can it be treated uh, so um, like i said you know some of them are like uh, some of them uh, the viruses the hpv virus will just cause warts so these warts can just be excised like i said you know you can do a cryoablation you can do uh, a biopsy and uh, just remove them but some of the lesions which supposing they come back the pathologist gives you a report that yes it's positive uh mm-hmm. then we would again use these other tests to see if it's it's a cancer which is limited to the cervix and there's a grading which is done 1a 1b 2 uh, 3 4 you know that sort of they give you a stage for the cancer mm-hmm. depending on that if it's like 1 and 2 that means it's only spread to the cervix and maybe a little bit of the vagina then we will excise it like i said instead of doing a biopsy the complete thing will be excised Okay. However, if it has spread further away from that, then we need to remove the entire of the uterus and sometimes not just a hysterectomy but also oophorectomy that means removing both the ovaries and the vagina. So that goes into the category of radical hysterectomy. And post that we also do some lymph node dissection. Unfortunately in very advanced cases if it involves the rectum, if it involves the urinary bladder, we need to do something which is known as a pelvic exenteration which means removing all these organs en masse. and uh, you know we'll have to do other surgeries so that the woman will be able to pass urine pass stools um and post all of this they're given chemo chemo is the common uh, drugs that we use carboplatin cisplatin ifosfamide uh, gemcitabine and uh, we also use radiation therapy the radiation therapy can be of two types it can be external beam radiation that means externally it's being given to the woman over the pelvis and the pelvic area we also now have internal beam radiation wherein there are seeds or wires which are inserted into the vagina and uh, that directly you know uh, only in that local area the radiation would spread not causing so much uh, you know skin burns and all those other complications that come in with radiation to the other parts of the pelvis so now um, we've advanced with all those uh, things so yeah in a nutshell i think these are the main things that we do for treatment but uh, definitely like if you if it's caught in the early stages the survival rate is as high as 91% even if it's caught when it's like locally spread the survival is as high as 67% however if it spreads to like the organs like i said the rectum urinary bladder then it really falls down to 19 to 20% but like cervical cancer something which is really preventable and even if caught early with all these screening measures that we just spoke about it's very very uh, the five year survival is very high so uh, that's a very good thing the prognosis is great wow that is really great for the number of pers- the percentage actually that you just quoted uh, the survival rate is really high so that yes. definitely should be uh, one of the uh, positive factors for women to actually get them screened on a regular basis so Absolutely. that they can catch the uh, cancer at a very early stage so since the survival rate is really very high so that is one thing that is a one good takeaway uh, point i think that would that we can highlight on so uh, now that you mentioned about um, the treatment aspect uh, to which women uh, you also mentioned which women are at risk for cervical cancer if you can just give us some light or not on uh, about how can it be prevented what are the measures or the parameters that one can follow so you know in india a statistic was uh, saying that there are 511 million women who are 15 years or older who are at risk for this sort of cancer and uh, if you see the global cancer statistics there was a big conference done in 2020 and they said that cervical cancer is the second most common in india 25% of all the cancer deaths that happen are because of cervical cancer uh, out of around like 1 lakh 20000 women who are diagnosed every year 77000 of them die because it's advanced so how do we prevent all this and bring down these numbers So there are like it's a two pronged approach. The first thing would be that all our young girls, and that would be starting from the age as early as nine. And why? Why just the girls? Like I just quoted, you know, one in three men have HPV. So even our boys, 
we can give them the HPV vaccine. And uh, the good part is that we had two vaccines which were available from like abroad. But now we, since January 2023, we, you know, Serum Institute of India has uh, Servavac, which is our own indigenous vaccine. It's very cheap. Uh, it makes it more affordable, more accessible for all people in India, all women and men in India. So from the age group of 9 to I would say 15, it would be really nice if the girls and the boys are vaccinated. Uh, usually it's two doses uh, at 0, 1 and 1 month apart. Uh, and if not, post 15 years, um, best is if just before the sexual debut or the first time that they have intercourse, it would be the most effective. But even if not, uh, they can take, uh, there are two types of vaccines. There's one where you can give it at zero, that means today after one month and after six months or today after two months and after six months. And um, uh, for women who are, let's say, above 25 years of age and have not been able to take these, vac uh, these vaccines, no problem you can still take it the only thing is that they need counseling that maybe maybe because they had already initiated intercourse they may have been exposed to you know certain strains of hpv so it's better that they take the vaccine as well as you know um, use like safe sex uh, precautions and keep doing their screening because they've already been exposed um and also uh, i feel screening screening is so important uh, i feel like uh, the moment a person is 21 the girls they should start going for screening and the screening is not something which you have to keep on doing six monthly or one year once you do a screening at 21 for three to five years you shouldn't bother once you have like a negative report uh, three years would be a safe bet but even five years is fine so every three to five years doing an hpv test and a pap smear would be very very great and once you hit um, the age group between 21 to 29, I think three years is great. Once you hit the age group above 30 to 65 years, you can do it every three years. And above 65, usually the, um, you know, the risk factors really go down. So depending mm -hmm. upon what your health status is, you can just speak to your physician and they would recommend either every five yearly or they might even say that, okay, you've consistently had like negative uh, pap smears, so don't worry about it anymore. So yeah, this is basically how it goes. A little bit I would just like to add about what vaccines are available. So there are three types, like I said, two are from abroad, which is called Gardasil. There's one which has the four strains, which are most common, which is 6, um, 11, 16 and 18. And um, the other one, the second one, which is there has nine different types of strains. And the one that we've made in India has the four strains, which I just mentioned. But all of them are very safe, equally effective, and there are absolutely no side effects other than just soreness and little bit of pain, which you get with any vaccination. That's great, uh, ma'am. You've actually given us a, you've got a great insight about the importance of cervical uh, vaccines as well. So now that we know that their uh, Serum Institute has initiated it from January 2023, it's definitely an urge for all the women uh, and men. Obviously, as you mentioned about Absolutely. the data, it is definitely advised to get uh, their vaccine done, even be it at any age. There is no age foundation, right? Anybody can get it done anytime. So that is definitely one uh, good message any add-on or any further uh, takeaway messages that you would want to add on here yeah just one thing that uh, you know uh, when we speak about men like every, you know people think why men and why should they get it but not just cervical cancer HPVs can also cause like penile cancers uh, oral cancers head and neck tumors uh, because you know they go and sit on your uh, the oral mucous membranes and the genital areas etc anal cancers so it's really important for the boys as well so I feel like parents who have like uh, you know boys they shouldn't think this is not for them it's for not just for you know uh, making it safe for the spouse or the partner but also for your own child and uh, one more thing like uh, like I said you know this is we always talk about beating cancer and being able to cure cancer I think cervical cancer like I told you the statistics it's one of the cancers with 90% we can like literally like nobody can get this cancer if you just take these vaccines take a few steps of you know going for your screenings take a few steps of you know having safe sex practices so I feel like this is something which, uh, you know, we can beat. This is one cancer that we can literally make from being the second most common cancer. We can make it to like a non-existent cancer. So I think everyone, I urge everyone, whether it's boys or girls, to just go ahead and take the vaccine. And uh, like I said, now it's even more affordable and accessible too. And um, I, you know, I pray that someday it becomes like very openly and easily available in the public sector also the, with the government's vaccination set schedule so that like everyone, despite like which whichever socioeconomic strata they're in, they're able to access and get these vaccines. 
uh it was a lovely interactive session to be having with you today dr divya you gave us a lot of information about cervical cancer and i think this is going to create a lot of awareness our main motive is for education and if this gives us more insights and as you mentioned about the details the different aspects of cervical cancer it's definitely going to benefit i think a lot of uh, people uh, from this so thank you so much for joining in at, in at medical dialogues today and thank you for all your valuable information that you've just passed on to us Thank you so much. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.